know, behind me is a beautiful stained glass window. We have Jesus, we have the cross, and, you know, I think about it, and, um, you know, I know I've been redeemed, I've been saved, um, made right with Him. Uh, very often, I take for granted or forget uh, just what it took for Jesus to walk through all that. Because I want to do my own thing, I want to do it my own way. Or forget His grace and mercy. Um, uh, that cost was great. Uh, but he was still willing to do it. Regardless, he knew how stubborn I would be. Uh, he knew where I would fall and where I'd fail. And he would know how stubborn you can be. How you can fall and fail. Because we're all in it together. His great mercy is that is it's great. Um, so as we sing this song, it's a song about just laying everything down um, at His feet. It's about us surrendering. It's about remembering the cost uh, of the cross and the glory of His resurrection. So let's lift up our voices, uh, lay down our wills, that 
Lord, that's what we do this morning. We worship you because you are worthy of it. Lord, I realize there's not enough songs we can sing. We can't sing loud enough. We can't. Uh, there's nothing we can do to give you what you truly deserve. But God, thank you that when we come here, when we lift ourselves up to you, when we proclaim your name, when we worship you, I put a smile on your face. God, thank you for your great faithfulness and love to us. Lord, we know we don't deserve it. We can't earn it. But Lord, that makes your sacrifice all the sweeter, all the more amazing. Uh, your love is overwhelming. And God, we just praise you in this moment and thank you for redeeming us, for loving us, faithfulness, mercy, and love. Lord, as we enter a time of hearing your word, uh, God, please soften our hearts. Pray that your word would take room in our hearts. Help us to grow closer to you, to hear you, to be able to walk with you today and this week. God, thank you for this time, and thank you for meeting us here. In Jesus' name. Hey, before you're seated, wave at everybody, give them a throw them a kiss if you want to. That's, that's all right, too. Let them know that you're glad to see them here today. All right, Pastor. Jim wants to say a little something. That's dangerous when you give a drink. Jim wants something here. Uh, I would just like to thank my church family for all the prayers, all the cards, all the phone calls. Lifted me up when I was when I was sick. I was here last week, but only about seventy-five percent here. And I just want to thank my church family. I love you guys, and it is so good to see Miss Sandy back. God is still on the throne, and prayer changes things. Amen. And we've had a miracle today. That that was less than five minutes. That was good. That was good. I'm not. I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna try to jump right in there. Get your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 11. While you're turning there, let me do a commercial for you because I'd love to invite you if you've not taken advantage of another Bible study that I'm doing every week. You know we don't do our Wednesday night yet uh, until we get into phase three and things kind of settle down. We're we're just gonna do what we're doing right now. But I'm still continuing on our Wednesday night Bible study. And we're in 1 Peter, and that second song that we sang this morning was what I preached or taught on Wednesday night. 1 Peter chapter 2, that Jesus is the what? Cornerstone. See, you're, you're paying attention. Jesus is the cornerstone. And I'd love for you to, I, it's on our web page. If you want to get there, you can look. I think I've got, I think I may have all of our studies where we started on 1 Peter. And um, what a, a rich, rich part of the Bible. So, encourage you to take a look at that. I would love for you to take advantage of that. <laughs> Acts chapter 11. We're continuing our look at this is God's house. Looking at the early church and some of the things that they went through, learning from that. What do we need to do? What do we need to avoid? How do we need to work? How do we need to change? Now, that's, a, that's a dirty word, isn't it, in a Baptist church? Change. Change is hard. We don't like it. We resist it. We may even leave because we just don't like it. Why? Because that's simply not the way we do things. Now, Peter, the main leader of the early church, more than exemplified this attitude. And his success, remember when he preached, thousands came and joined the church and were saved and and his success certainly underscored his idea. You see, his idea was that the way, and that's what the, what the early church was called, the way, was for one group and one group only, and that was the Jews. You had to be Jewish or 
your salvation was not going to come to you. That was until God spoke up. And we, uh, we did that last week where Peter hears God in a vision. And he sees this vision of these animals, clean and many unclean. And that's where God speaks to him. He says, take and eat. And he says, I don't touch unclean animals. He said, what I call clean is not unclean anymore. And so you remember the encounter that he hears a knock on the door. It's from Cornelius, the Gentile uh, centurion. And he goes and shares the gospel with him. That whole crowd is, is saved. And now things are starting to change. And that change does not come easily. In fact, that's where we pick up on chapter 11, verse 1. The apostles and the brothers and sisters who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Sound like a good thing, right? It would be if you're Gentile. When Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. And when I say that change is hard, that's exactly what I mean. Peter follows exactly what God told him to do. And as soon as he gets back to Jerusalem, he meets with a group called the Circumcision Party. Now, there was no party going on, right? But what concerns me is we're only about six to eight years into the church. And already we have groups within the church. Aren't you glad they're not Baptists? And we, we, we tend to do that, don't we? I, I think it's because we're people. I'm pretty sure that's the reason that it is. But within this group of folks who were saved at Jerusalem, there was the circumcision group, and they said, wait a minute, hold the phone, back it up, what do you think you're doing? This is not the way it's supposed to be. And they began to criticize. I looked up that word, criticize. I mean to, to separate oneself in a hostile spirit. They didn't just say, give us some report. Tell us what's happening. We're not sure. But they came up there and they were ready to take Peter's head off. Because he had done the wrong thing. Why did they criticize? Well, they looked at the background, culture, and ethnicity of these Gentiles, but they were unwilling to look at their heart. For centuries, what made Jews the chosen of God were their traditions and their religious customs, and it began with the covenant of circumcision. Basically, they said, you can't be one of us and look like one of them. So it can't be. Remember, this was the first time that we had a problem with looking at the outside and looking at the inside. Remember when Samuel was to go and find the next king? And he goes to Jesse and he says, you got some sons? I'm supposed to be here and anoint a king. And every one of them looked kingly except the last one, which was David. He was a young guy about my size almost as good looking, but that's beside the point. But he was, he was just a little guy, and he said, you sure about that? He doesn't look like a king. He said, listen, God, man looks on the outside, but God looks at the what? Looks at the heart. See, God is looking at what is essential. We look on the things that are less essential, and we make them up to be extremely essential. Well, the result was, in the following verses, we will read them, in the following verses, Peter recounts what he did and what God did in the house of Cornelius. And by the way, this is the third time in two chapters that it's repeated. Now, that's significant. Anytime you see repetition, it's significant. When you see it three times, it's really significant. Why? Because this is Christianity at the crossroads. 
where Christianity will either remain a Jewish religious sect or God will accomplish what he told Abraham that all the world will be blessed through him. So Peter explained in verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came down on them and just as on us at the beginning. Do you remember the guys when we, when we started together back at Pentecost? Same way. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he also gave to us when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, how could I possibly hinder God? That's a great question. Notice the response. When they heard this, they became silent. This is a business meeting, right? And all of a sudden, a hush falls on the crowd. We could go either way. I want you to recognize the tension in the room. It could go either way. The circumcision party could have made phone calls that day and said, listen, we need to get our people together because something's going to happen in our church. A hush falls on the crowd. But aren't you glad the Spirit of God takes over? Amen. And they glorified God saying, so then, God has given repentance resulting in life even to the Gentiles. I guess we were wrong. Some of the Circumcision party said, we weren't really wrong, but I guess we'll go along with the majority on this one. <laughs> now, I want you to understand, and we'll get to it in a few weeks, this won't be the last time that the Jerusalem church had issues with change. It happens again. They, they really get a little upset. They basically say, don't mess with my church. But right on time, right on time, God begins the next phase of changing things. Verse 19. Now, those who have been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them Men from Cyprus, Cyprus and Cyrene who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Now, you see what's happening here? Remember, the persecution was in the church. This was still ongoing. There was still all kinds of problems. And so the, the disciples were still being scattered all over the region. And there was a group that went to Phoenicia, Cyprus, or, or to Antioch and some other places. But when they went, they only spoke to the Jews. Now that makes sense. Because the Jews, remember, think about it, logically speaking, the Jews are related to Jesus, right? Because he is a Jew. And they also have the background of God and the one God and they can talk about Messiah. It makes perfectly good sense to talk to the Jews because you would think that the Jews would be the first ones that would say, aha, I think I know what you're talking about. I get this Savior business. Tell me more. And so that's, they stayed there. But then there were these upstarts, these young fellows, these guys that, that weren't theologically trained by the circumcision party at least. And they went to a place called Antioch and started speaking to Gentiles, that's the Greeks. People like Cornelius, people who had no background at all in the one true God. They believed in numerous gods and goddesses and had all kinds of cults and strange things in their background. And Oh, and you need to understand something about Antioch. Antioch was a world-class city, a highly strategic city. In fact, it was the third largest city in the Roman world, third only behind Rome and Alexandria. There was about 
300,000 people living in that place. It was known for sports. In fact, those of you that know the Ben Hurst movie, Ben Hurst, that big chariot race that goes on, guess where it's located? In Antioch. It's exactly where it is. It was also where sex was worshipped. Sounds a little like Las Vegas. About five miles outside the city was the temple of Daphne, where sex was enthroned and worshipped through priestesses who were really religious prostitutes. I mean, it was a crazy city. It was highly international. There were all kinds of people. Because of the place where it was, it was a place where folks came and went and left and came and lived. And it, was a, it was a crazy place. And there was a bunch of Gentiles living here. You know, these, these Jewish fellows who went up there to share the gospel, they looked and said, we're not in Kansas anymore. And they didn't even know where Kansas was, but that's what they were saying. I mean, we're out of the little rural place, and we're in the big city. Well, the gospel won't work here. Because we don't have our nice little synagogues and things that we can go to. But someone said, wait a second. I think the gospel is not up to us. I think if we rely upon the power of God, all we need to do is share the good news. That's what we need to do. And they did. And people by the hundreds and thousands began to come to faith in Jesus Christ. These Gentiles that were coming out of all kinds of cults and fetishes and strange things were relieving that and turning and giving their hearts over to the crucified, resurrected Jesus Christ. Verse 22. News about them reached the church in Jerusalem. Don't you, wouldn't you love to be in that circumcision party about that time? Uh-oh. It's getting worse. I thought we were just going to stick with Cornelius. But there's a breakout in Antioch. And they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. Now, I don't know the, the thought behind it. I think some of it was to encourage them and bolster them. But I have a strong suspicion that this is a bit of a recon mission. We want to make sure that these guys are doing it the right way. And if not... They're out of here. But God, in the middle of this, sends the perfect person, Barnabas. He goes in that pivotal moment, and I want you to look at his response. And he could have gone up there and said, whoa, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. The way we do it back in our Jerusalem church is nothing like this. You're going to have to do it this way, this way, this way. And then you, you can't do it any other way. Then really easy for him to do that, right? Because he had the authority of the disciples, the apostles at this point. But look what he does. Verse 23. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. Why? For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And large numbers of people were added to the Lord. Then he went to Tarsus to search for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught large numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Now, such, such a great thing here. The real name for Barnabas, by the way, if you go back a few chapters, you find out his name is Joseph. But the way that he was and the way that he behaved among people, he was such an encourager, the disciples renamed him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. I want you to notice his reaction as he comes on the scene. First thing that I see is he had a gracious sight. He saw the grace of God. Now, some people I know have many gifts. You all have lots of gifts, but some have the gift of criticism. <laughs> and you're happy to share it at any time. 
Aren't you glad that he doesn't have the gift of criticism? Instead, he has the gift of seeing graciously. Man, he begins to see what God is doing, not what they're not. Do you think they had some mistakes? Absolutely. Do you think they had everything just proper the way it should be? No way. But that isn't what he begins to major on. He majors on, boy, you've got God in your hearts and you're proclaiming the, the good news of Jesus Christ. Way to go, guys. This is great. He had a gracious sight. I think he also had a joyful attitude. He said that he was glad. He was glad. Tell you what, one of the things I hate about the masks is you can't see your face. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what's going on underneath there. One of the things I love to see is smiles, gladness, joy. Listen, you, you can use that mask, and you need to use it where you need to use it, but don't let something else mask your joy. He's there, and he sees graciously, and he says, I'm so happy for you guys. And that, you know what? You know, you have that old phrase, uh, honey draws more flies than what, vinegar or something like that. Have you noticed that someone who is joyful and glad and has, a, has a, a, an overwhelming great attitude that there are people that flock around them? You know why? Because most of us need that. And Barnabas, he gets there and he says, boy, I see some good things and, and I'm so happy for you. And they're saying, we were afraid you were from the circumcision party. We had heard about that. But instead, you're from the share Jesus party. That's a good one. Why did he have that kind of attitude? I want you to look at it. Because... The Holy Spirit put this through Luke's heart and through his pen. So he lets you know, he says that he, he would, oh, he had one, one other thing. That was, he encouraged all of them. He had stirring words. Well, how is it he had a gracious sight and, and joyful attitude and stirring words, you know, encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord? Why was that? He says it was because he was a good man, full of faith, of the Holy Spirit, and full of faith. He was a good man. That, that word means that he was genuine. That didn't mean he put on a face so he could get friends. That's who he was. And he was full of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? He was speaking in tongues all the time? No. It was because he was full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self -control. You understand that the Holy Spirit was being evidenced in the way that he was working with them. And of faith, he said, guys, you think you're doing some great things than you are, but I believe that God has even greater things in store for you. He had a vision and he had a faith. And the result was large numbers of people were being added to the Lord. But he wasn't finished yet. I mean, Barnabas could have said, Man, I'm going to be a pastor of a mega church. It's going to be so good. And when the apostles come, it's going, I'm going to be able to show. He could have done that. But he doesn't do that. Doesn't do that at all. Instead, he says, you know, this is more than I can handle. Now, you know what that took? It took humility. A lot of us are missing that. He said, I, I, can't, I can't do this. I need, I need somebody else. And, and, and he begins to pray and begins to think. And he remembers an old boy named Saul. And he goes a hundred miles away. That's a long distance in the day and time. A hundred miles away to a place called Tarsus. And he begins to look up Saul. Now, Saul spent about eight years, as I can understand the, the chronology. It's been about eight to ten years since his conversion. And if you go back, we didn't go over it, but if you go back, as he's converted, he, he tries to preach, he tries to do this, and he goes to the Damascus, he has to be lowered in a basket. I mean, there's all kinds of things, and basically, he's back in Tarsus, not doing a whole lot. Now, he's, I'm sure he's teaching, he's preaching, but there's nothing great. It isn't like, you need a mega pastor, here's the guy we're going to get. Not at all. In fact, I have a feeling that when Saul came to the church, it was kind of like, 
We thought the circumcision party was our worst enemy. Now we got Saul. I don't know what's going to happen here. But he goes up and he finds Saul and he brings him back with him and he says, we need to work together. You know what? I don't know if he knew this, but he was certainly willing to do it. It starts out here in, in Acts as Saul or Barnabas and Saul, but it isn't very long. It is Paul and Barnabas. And Paul begins to be the lead man, and Barnabas, in his wisdom, his humility, he was, remember, he has a good man, full of Holy Spirit, full of faith. He says, you're God's man, you lead us. Oh, there's one other thing. I thought this was so interesting. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. I did a little study on this and found out some things. You know, why, why, why were they first called Christians at Antioch? Well, it's because they defied description. They defied description. Here's an interesting thing about Antioch. Apparently, Antioch had been built several centuries prior to this. And the one who built it, by the way, it was named after uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, who actually built or took a pig and desecrated the altar. I mean, it was a bad, bad dude who was named after. This was a bad thing. And, but when he builds the city in his father's, I think it was his, I think it was his father's um, honor, he knows it's going to be an international city. Why? Because of his location. There's going to be people coming and going, and so he builds it in a very strange way. Archaeologists have discovered these very things. What he did in this large city, he built 18 ghettos with walls. Sounds kind of political, doesn't it? But he built walls. You know why he did that? To keep everybody apart. He said, if we get some guys over here and guys over here that don't like each other, we're going to have a war here. So he built walls and put them in compartments and said, you all stay there. And you all stay there. And we're going to be okay. And that's what they did. Then these guys come along. Have a look at verse chapter 13, verse 1. Now in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they were worshiping and fasting, uh, the, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for I have worked for them, which I have called them. Then after that, after they had fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them all. Now I want you to notice that, that interesting group of leaders. Barnabas, he's a Jew from Cyprus. Simon, called Niger, is a black man from Africa. Lucius of Cyrene is from North Africa, which would be an Arabian person. Manan, friend of Herod, was Herod was the king. That means he was way up in society. He was in the upper crust. And you got Saul, a Jewish scholar. And now what were they doing? They were breaking down the walls. Isn't that what Paul said? We're breaking down the walls. And they came together. And we don't know what to call these guys. They're not Jews. They're not this. They're, they're not African. They're not Arabian. They're, they're not Cyrus. They're all. We're going to call them little Christs. We're going to call them Christ's men. Because all they ever talk about is this person called Christ. Wouldn't it be great to be called a Christian because of all that you did was talk about Jesus and say, that's all they ever get to come up across is about somebody about this Jesus guy. Hmm. What made the difference in this church? What, what made it, instead of going backwards, what helped start it and advance it and accomplished it for all that Jesus wanted to accomplish? Well, obviously, it was the hand of God. Obviously. That's a given. But part of the divine handiwork was using a man called Barnabas, the son of encouragement, who goes to this new Gentile work in Christ and does what he says his name is. He encouraged them. Now, let me give you the word that means encourage in the original language. The word is parakaleo. 
That is the word that means encourage. That's interesting. It's made of two words, power, para, and kaleo. And, and kaleo means to call someone to a goal. It's, it's uh, if you watch any of the uh, sports, football coaches are out there, and they're yelling at their players. They're telling them, go, go, harder, harder, do this, that, that, that. all those kind of things. That's a kaleo. Now, you know, unless you're going to reply, you're not saying, golly, that sounds nice, coach. I don't think so. You're saying, oh, man, that's hard, but we know the coach has something in mind. And, but there's a second word. There's a hard word, which means I want you to go on in the goal. The other one is I'm going to be with you, para. I am right beside you. That's where we get the, we get in a parachute because it's right with us. A paramedic who is a medic right beside you. A paralegal who works alongside a, a, a legal person, a lawyer. And so it's a hard, soft word. The parakaleo, this word of encouragement, means to be with you, but in a strong, tender manner. It's interesting. <clears throat> if you go back to John 14, Jesus, before he goes to the cross, talks to his disciple and he says, I am sending you, and he uses the noun form. I'm sending you the paraclete. That's the one who is going to be with you. And in fact, he says it this way. I will send you another paraclete. 1 John 2, 1. Who is that other paraclete? My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, a paraclete with the Father. Jesus Christ is the righteous one. Who is the first paraclete? It is let me try that again. The first paraclete is? Is Jesus. Exactly right. The first paraclete. And by the way, when you get you get this strong, comforting word of paracleto, when it becomes a noun, it also means an advocate. What's an advocate? It's a lawyer on your defense. It's the defense attorney. And whenever the defense attorney speaks, he is speaking in your place. And he's saying, the first one, the first advocate, the first paraclete is Jesus. And Jesus, as he ascends to the Father, he stands every day in your defense before the Father. And he says, I have given my life for that person down there. You cannot judge them guilty because you've already judged me guilty. That would be a miscarriage of justice. And on your behalf, he, every day, he is sharing the good news of the encouragement for you. But then he sends another comfort. And what is the other comfort? Who is the other comfort? The other comfort is the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and when the Holy Spirit comes, here is what he does. He tells us and reminds us. Well, let's, let's read it together. Look at John 14. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. What does the second paraclete do? What does the second encourager do? He stands in us and says, I want you to remember what Jesus has done on your behalf. I want you to understand that he went to the cross. I want you to understand that he's, he is resurrected in glory. I want you to understand that he stands today before the Father on your behalf and nothing can separate you from the love in Jesus Christ. I want you to remember that when you're criticized and when you're struggling and when you're afraid. I want you to know that and you get the encouragement of the Holy Spirit because the Comforter is reminding you about the Comforter. The Encourager is reminding you about the Encourager. And then it all comes to us. And then it all comes to you and me. So the application is that you want to change the world. Then there probably needs to be some change in your life as well. We need to be genuine, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And our words should lift others to the throne and bring life and hope, not strife and division. One of my new favorite passages I want to share with you. I mentioned it last, just a couple of verses on Wednesday night's study. 
Let me give you the full enchilada here. Titus 3, verse 1b. And here's Paul saying to Titus, be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, and to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But look at this now. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, He poured out His Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that having been justified by His grace, we have become heirs with the hope of eternal life. Don't forget it. This saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on all on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish debates and genealogies and quarrels and disputes about the law because they are unprofitable and they are worthless. You want to change the world? Then you need to be changed by the Holy Spirit. We need to be done that all the time. Uh, if you're done with the Holy Spirit yet, and He's done with you, then I will be available for a funeral this week. Because if you're alive and breathing, the Holy Spirit is still changing and molding and making you like Jesus, if you are willing. And one of the ways you're going to know that is the way you talk to one another and about one another and with one another. Is it going to be uplifting, encouraging, or is it going to be something else? Is it going to be done because pastor said I need to be nice this week? Or is it going to be done because you're full of the Holy Spirit and of faith and genuine? I was uh, here early this morning. I was here early on Sunday mornings and... and um, you know, when you open your tablet, your iPad, uh, some of the things that are that are kind of news items, it'll be up there. And I, I, I get on Twitter a little bit, not a whole lot. I get on Twitter a little bit. And I've got several folks, most of them in, in church settings, because I like to be encouraged. I like to be enthused. I like to be uplifted. And so uh, I saw one this morning. I thought, I need to look at that. It was from Beth Moore. She said this. The wildest thing just happened. I pulled up to pay for my order in Starbucks drive through and they said, the customer in front of you paid your order. Now that's pretty cool. That happened to us just a couple weeks ago. Oh, wow, that's really neat. She said, oh wow. Then let me pay for the person behind you. He replied, get this. She paid for the whole line. Now that's not over. Wish I could show you this. And then he handed me this. There's a picture of a little piece of paper, just about this big. That obviously this person had made and cut out and gave in the in the pay window there to hand out to people of those people that she had paid their their order for. It's a little picture on the side of a small building, just a little older building, kind of like a, just a small little store. And here's what it says on the other side of that paper. I stole from this store when I was young. This store is no longer open. So I'm using this opportunity to pay your tab and make amends. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Did you get that? Let me apply that. Let me apply it real, real closely to you. You stole something from God. You know what it was? His goodness. You caused the death of His only Son. You brought grief in the life of God, and yet God mercifully forgave you through faith. Every day we need to have, open, have a little piece of paper have a picture of us as a, as a young person said, 
I stole from God. I disappointed God. And yet God saved me as I asked him to. And in the rest of my life, I want to pay this back, not to get anything, but just to let you know how blessed I am. See, that was Barnabas. That was Barnabas. He was so encouraging, not because that was his nature, but because he recognized who he was, what he did, who Jesus was, and how that comforter had come before the throne and in his life. And he said, I want to pay it back the rest of my days. I, like it. I, I just saw that this morning. The last thing on there that Beth Moore wrote, she said, I just want to cry. So do I. Let's cry out to the Lord. Father, how I love you this morning. How I thank you for the goodness and graciousness that you have given to us. As Derek said this morning, far too many times we simply gloss over the facts. We simply just recognize and acknowledge that we are saved and you're a God and that Jesus died and he's been raised from the dead and we know that, but it has not melted our hearts. It's not changed us. It's not moved us. And this morning, I pray, as we live, as we leave this place, as we live our lives this week, that we would be an encourager. That we would be purposely sharing our lives and the gospel as we have opportunities. May we be known for who we are, not critics, not, not circumcision party, not the people who know things, but rather as, as genuine people full of the Holy Spirit and faith as we lift up others in kindness and in love. We love you and we thank you for how you've loved us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. And uh, as we go, let's just enjoy God's presence in the midst of others. Now come up and say hello to Sandy at a distance. Give her, give her a virtual hug. Make sure that you enjoy one another in the Lord this week. Thank you so much for being here.